Have you seen the pictures of the sequoia reds up here in California? These huge trees, like some of the trunks could be as nearly big as this room. I've seen those photos where they've actually dug out a tunnel in a trunk of a tree. You can drive a full-size SUV right through it. That all started with a little seed. If you leave a seed of lies in your heart and in your mind and you don't know the truth, if you don't know the truth, you will die with the lie. I started dying because I started believing what I was told. I want you to know the three things that I needed to come to in my life is the truth of my value, the truth of my purpose, and the truth of my destiny. I want you to know something. In our mind, we put ourselves down all the time. I want to ask you today, do you think I'm cool enough to be your friend? But I don't swear, I don't use the F-bomb. Am I still cool enough to be your friend? But I don't tease people. Am I still cool enough to be your friend? But I have no arms, no legs. Seriously. You would be my friend even though I have no arms, no legs. So you're telling me it actually doesn't matter, right? If it actually doesn't matter for how we look, then why do we tease each other for how we look if it actually doesn't matter? Why is it that we look ourselves in the mirror and we see ourselves, well, we're having fun. Oh yeah, man, we just, it's just part of the culture, man. You don't know that you might be playing around I could pretty much say that 98% of you have teased someone in your life. I tried to commit suicide because of people who thought they were having fun. Not knowing the hell that I was going through. The people you're teasing. What if the person you're teasing is the person who's thinking of committing suicide? What if the person you're teasing is the one who's trying to commit suicide, who hates their life because of you? You don't know if the person you are teasing is the son or daughter of a drunk at home getting abused. And all they need is someone like you to keep on pushing them this way. We need hope. So find something else to do. Find positive things in your own life. I don't care about how you look. I will never, ever, ever tease you. I will never tease you. I could tease you. I could be tough. People thinking that bullying is tough. It ain't tough. My wheelchair, this is tough. This thing, man. I'll tell you something. You ready? This wheelchair. This thing's so tough. When my friend built this for me, he said, you're gonna love it. I said, what, does it go fast? He said, no, but it's tough. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, you'll find out. The torque in these motors at the bottom, at the back, this thing, if someone's holding it, I'm telling you, it can go 90 degrees. I went 80 degrees up, all right? Someone's holding me to make sure I don't tip back. My wife, she loves shopping with me because she just jumps on the back and we go shopping. Like, she just shops and shops because she doesn't drop, right? We just go and do it. It's fun. Now, what I tried one day to do, you'll never believe me, maybe you will, just know that every word that comes out of my mouth is not an exaggeration. One day, I needed to move a car. So I got my wife to put my car, my 66 Chevelle, in neutral. It's a two and a half ton car and I backed it back with this thing. Two and just this, just like this, like, like nothing. This thing is tough. Guess what? The definition of tough means it's strong. To show your strength, you need to do something that's difficult. I would sound so stupid if I said, hey guys, I got a Matchbox car one day and I got some fishing line and I towed that Matchbox car all around all day. How tough is my BMW? 
That's stupid. That's the same thing with bullying. You think you're tough? You're trying to show your strength? That's not your strength. Let me get, let me come back in 10 years and let me get your three, anyone have a three-year-old nephew? Anybody have a three-year-old nephew? Cool, put your hands down. I will get any one of your three-year-old nephews, bring them tomorrow night at where I'm speaking and we're gonna put them up on stage and let me show you how tough I am. We'll get your three-year-old nephew and we'll put him up here on the table and let me tease him. Let me show you how tough I am. That's what you are. I could pick on you, you biggest bullies. I could pick on anything you like, any singer, any music that you like. I could tease you. I could tease your family. I could tease your friends. I could tease about the movies that you that you think are really cool. I could tease anything about you. I could tease you about your nose, your eyes, your teeth, your chin, your hair, your ears, your elbows, your knees, your whatever, man. I can tease you about anything. It ain't hard, just like you can tease me. You want to know what tough is? Go to the people you teased and say sorry. You want to know what tough is? Go up to the people who still tease you and say, hey, stop it. I forgive you, but please stop it. That's tough. I want you to know something, the truth of who you are. I don't care what job you get. I don't care. I don't care how smart you are, everyone. I don't care. I don't care. I love you and I believe in you. I don't care if you end up being a janitor in this school. I'll tell you why. Because the janitor in my high school inspired me to be a speaker. He changed my life. My parents always said, Nick, you don't know what you can achieve until you try it. And uh, the doctors looked at me and said, he's not going to walk, he's not going to go to school, he's not going to do anything in his life. And then my parents, they just loved me like crazy and said, you got to try. Try this, try that, try this, try that. And I'm thinking sometimes like, mom and dad, you're crazy, man. I have no arms, no legs. How would I ever be able to do this or do that? But they encouraged me and they loved me. And as human beings, we're waiting for stuff like that. We all want love. Everybody say, love. Very good. We all want love. And you know, I went to school and, and I, you know, I wanted to be cool. You know, you go to school and, and you, you, you want to be accepted, you know. And so you see these guys and you're like, oh man, you know. Everyone swears like every third sentence. F this and F that and F and this and F, F. Like what? Like the, the, they think they're cool, you know? And so I'm thinking, man, may, maybe I need to be like them to be cool. And then you compare each other with how we look and, and I wish I was smarter, I wish I was taller, I wish I was shorter, I wish I was more popular, I wish I did this, I wish I didn't have that. I wish my life was different. That was me when I was about eight years old. I looked at myself and I looked at everybody else and everyone else had more than me. And I'm asking, why? Why me? Have you ever asked the why me questions, but get nowhere? If I had no answers from the doctors and if I had no answers from my parents, I still have a choice every day in my life to keep going or give up. You see this book up here? This is my favorite book in the whole wide world. This is my favorite book, the Bible. And here I am. And here I am, and for me, that's my full potential in all that I can be here on earth. And so encouragement takes me closer to all that I can be, and discouragement takes me away. You see, it only takes three seconds for someone to tease me when I was at school and just say, Hey, you ugly. Yeah. Hey, you can't do this and you can't do that. And some of you are thinking like, man, seriously? You had kids picking on you, like how heartless are those kids? Picking on me with no limbs, like you would probably say, well, I'm not that bad. I wouldn't pick on a kid with no limbs. But why would you pick on anyone? Well, because it's fun, it's just culture. Okay, we'll get to that. But for me, me facing all that stuff, I'm getting these seeds. Everybody say seeds, S-E-E-D-S, seeds. Would you have gotten more education? 
practiced and practiced at your favorite sport until you had a chance of becoming a pro. Learn to read and write music and play an instrument. Study engineering so you could design and sell the ideas you're always dreaming up. Actually, there are things you've accomplished through self-discipline way back in your childhood. Just think, how long did it take you to learn how to walk? Or how many weeks and months did you struggle to stand upright? How many bruises did you get from falling down? And how many times did you pick yourself up and try again? You learned to walk because as a toddler, you became obsessed with learning to walk. You were determined to learn, no matter how hard it was at first or how long it was going to take. Every step you took was a small victory. And every time you fell down, it was just an excuse to start all over. Children are naturally self-disciplined because children believe that everything is possible. Children don't say, I can't do it. Children say, I want to do it. When you want something badly enough, and when you believe in it strongly enough, self-discipline will get it for you. Self-discipline is the most powerful tool you own for bridging the gap between wishful thinking and real fulfillment. Without it, you can only stare, as author Amy Gross says, like a window shopper at the good things of life and shrug and move on. You can have those good things by developing the self-discipline to achieve them. What do you want that you're willing to pay the price for? What means so much to you that you'll spend weeks, months, or years pursuing it? Start thinking about your most cherished dream because with the power of self-discipline, you're finally going to be able to achieve it. And this program will teach you how. The neuropsychology of self-discipline, your master key to success, will show you how to take the raw materials you already possess, your talent, intelligence, strength, and motivation, and turn them into the assets you need to achieve your life's goals. You'll learn how to gain the knowledge and skills that will set you on the path to success and you'll learn to develop the kind of positive strength it takes to stay on that path until you have reached the very end. You may think it's impossible for you to develop the kind of self-discipline you see others using to achieve success. You may think you're too lazy, too scattered, too quick to give up. And that may be true of the way you're behaving now. But most people aren't self-disciplined because they never had a chance to experience the kind of joy and satisfaction that comes with mastering their own abilities and applying them to the one thing they really want in life. Once you get a taste of how intoxicating, of how free self-discipline feels, you'll be hooked on it for life. The neuropsychology of self-discipline is not the result of pop psychological and faddish theories. Nor does it contain simplistic pablum like success gimmicks found so often in many self-improvement programs. The Neuropsychology of Self-Discipline program incorporates the breakthrough findings of one of the world's most respected brain researchers, Dr. Carl H. Prebram, director of the Stanford University Neuropsychological Research Laboratory, with the practical experience of CyberVision Systems' team of learning experts. Dr. Prebram is one of the most respected and renowned brain and behavioral researchers in the world. Trained as a neurosurgeon, Dr. Prebram has been conducting research into the brain and behavior for over 30 years. His pioneering work and discoveries have led to his being called the father of neuropsychology. Besides his responsibilities at Stanford, Dr. Prebram also serves as the director of advanced research for CyberVision Systems. The Neuropsychology of Self-Discipline incorporates two of Dr. Prebram's revolutionary discoveries. The first is his finding that our behavior is governed by images of achievement, and that without these images, we cannot mobilize and motivate ourselves to achieve our goals. The second is Dr. Prebram's discovery of how the human brain forms visual and sensory images, and how these images affect our emotions our power to commit ourselves to a course of action and see it through to the end with excellence through perseverance and persistence. Dr. Prebram's cutting-edge work lets us understand for the first time the relationship between thinking, sensing, motivation and behavior. And by collaborating with Dr. Prebram, CyberVision Systems has been able to develop a powerful technology that enables you to harness your own mental processes and motivate yourself to develop the kind of iron will that will carry you through thick and thin 
to achieve your goals. Every person who has made an enduring success of his or her life used self-discipline to get there. If self-discipline is so effective, why don't more people have it? Unfortunately, we live in a quick-fix society where old-fashioned effort isn't appreciated. Nearly everyone wants to be an overnight success. People spend their money as soon as they make it to get instant gratification through material things. And then the same people wonder why they're not getting anywhere. The truth is, without paying the price and without making an effort, most people will fail at what they set out to do. It takes years of hard work and discipline to master a skill or craft. Years of putting in seven-day work weeks to build a business from scratch into a multi-million dollar operation. Years of schooling and internship to get a medical degree and start a doctor's practice. And years of tempering and seasoning to become a prima ballerina. We all greatly admire successful artists, business people and doctors among others. But how many of us are willing to put in the years of work it took for these people to get where they are? The late Ray Kroc, the founder and guiding genius behind McDonald's restaurants, told a wonderful story about the contrast between the self-disciplined achiever and the wishful thinker in a speech he gave to MBA candidates at Dartmouth College. He said, I'm reminded of a story about the great pianist who gave a concert, and at the end the lady rushed up to him and said, I'd give anything in the world if I could play like that. And he said, no, you wouldn't. She could have if she wanted to. Anybody could. I know, as a piano player, that piano playing is mechanical to a great extent. But it's the dedication, the disciplining to practice that makes the difference. And when you're talking about a concert pianist, he has been practicing for years. Years of practice, several hours a day, every single day. Practice, 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 practice. Sacrifice and discipline. That's what it gets down to. And so he said, no, you wouldn't. Meaning that what she said she wanted to attain, she wouldn't pay the price to get. To discipline herself to do the studying and practicing required to be a concert pianist. How many times have you heard yourself say, I'd give anything to be a doctor, or a lawyer, or president of a company? or a singer, actress, or dancer, if only I had the talent or the education or the intelligence. The truth is, with a minimum of talent and average intelligence, you could be any one of those things. With a steady, sustained effort that never falters, never crumbles, and never gets lost in unimportant details, you can be anything you want. Many people believe that talent alone is the key to success. Talent might play its part, but it's not the difference. In every field of endeavor, millions of talented men and women with special talents are wasting away, contributing little to their own success or the good of mankind. And every day, we see others who are less gifted, but who have accomplished more. Many believe that education is the key to success. Though it is a valuable aid, it is not the difference. The educated derelict is a common sight, and so is the man or woman who has achieved phenomenal success without the advantage of a formal education. And many believe that intelligence is the key to success. Even though a person with a high degree of intelligence is fortunate and possesses the raw materials to be successful, the relationship between intelligence and accomplishment is something less than balanced. Every day we encounter highly intelligent people who barely get by, and their opposite number, men and women of average intelligence, but superior achievements. The one quality which sets one man apart from another, the one key which lifts one to every aspiration, while others are caught up in the mire of mediocrity, is not talent, formal education, nor intellectual brilliance. It's self-discipline. With self-discipline, all things are possible. It's the closest thing you could have to a wish-granting fairy godmother. Without self-discipline, even the simplest goal can seem like the impossible dream. In America today, the greatest cause of failure is the lack of self-discipline. Lacking self-discipline, millions of American dreams turn to ashes. With lofty visions of success, many people don't know that it takes more than wishful thinking, shortcuts, gimmicks, and get-rich-quick schemes to achieve excellence. Somehow, most people have lost sight of the age-old truth 
that anything worthwhile achieving takes time, organized persistent effort, and more time. As you look around you, you'll see the many obvious fruits of the undisciplined mind. Poverty, unhappiness, and drugs. The social cancer of a quick fix society. But it is the not so obvious, more subtle effects of the lack of self-discipline that we address here. The raw power and potential of talented and intelligent people that lies dormant, unchanneled, and wasted. Untapped and unfocused because of the inability of these people to commit and mobilize themselves to a course of consistent action. The lack of self-discipline is the number one killer of achievement in America. Successful people have one thing in common. They set their sights on a goal and work every hour of every day towards reaching it. They learned what they needed to do to reach that goal and they found a way to do it. If it meant taking on an extra job, they took the job. If it meant going to school at night, they attended evening classes. If it meant working countless hours seven days a week, they worked the hours. If it meant relocating themselves and their families, they moved. Success consists of self-discipline. And self-discipline consists of doing whatever you have to do for as long as you have to do it to get where you want to be. If you truly want to seek your fortune, you must develop the inner strength to relentlessly pursue your vision day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, until it becomes a reality. And it will become a reality. Stop and think about all the things you wish you'd accomplished, the things you know you could have accomplished. It's hard changing your life. It was hard when just over three years ago, in the Penobscot building in Detroit, Michigan, where I was operating my business and I fell on some hard times and I was sleeping in my office. It was hard coming into the lobby and the security said, excuse me, Mr. Brown, can we see you for a moment? And I said, yes. And I walked up to the counter and he gave me an envelope and he said, would you mind reading it here? And I opened the envelope and the envelope was from management that said, this is an office tower. It's not a hotel. Please do not sleep in your office. And I said, excuse me, sir. I said, I just work long hours in creating my business. I'm an entrepreneur. And right now things are bad for me, but they're not going to be this way always. And I just asked for the opportunity to continue to operate like I'm doing. I'm not trying to make this my home. And it was hard coming through the lobby. And sometimes they would laugh. There's a guy talking about becoming successful. And look at him. He's bathing in the bathroom upstairs on the 21st floor. He sleeps on the floor. Him and two other dreamers up there. Look at him. It was hard, ladies and gentlemen, coming to speak to people. And I was facing financial difficulties in my own life. I was behind on my bills and my dreams, and I'm saying to them, you can live your dream. It was hard, ladies and gentlemen. It was very difficult to pick myself up each day believing that I could do it. There were times that I doubted myself. I said, God, why, why is this happening to me? I'm just trying to take care of my children and my mother. I'm not trying to steal a rock from anybody. Why did this have to happen to me? It was very hard. And here's what I want to say to you. For those of you that have experienced some hardships, don't give up on your dream. No one could have convinced me by holding on, by continuing to push forward, by continuing to run toward my dream, that one day I would have my own talk show. It's a long shot, ladies and gentlemen, from Liberty City, an abandoned building on a floor never knowing my mother or father. It's a long shot being here with you today in this dome in Atlanta. It's a long shot. No college training, labeled, educable, mentally retarded. But I kept running toward my dream. If you'd only had the self-discipline to pursue them.
must feel that. That that's why you're here. Because you are the one. And I remember when PBS first played one of my specials called You Deserve. One Sunday afternoon in Miami, Florida. I had some friends call him to tell him to tune in. And he watched the program, he called me in Detroit, and I answered the phone, I said, hello? He said, may I speak to Les Brown, please? I said, who's calling? He said, you know who this is. I said, oh, Mr. Washington, it's you. He said, you were the one, weren't you? I said, yes, sir. He said, and you were so crazy. I said, I know, but I'm rich now. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's not going to be easy. It was hard laying on the floor of the Penobscot building, looking out of the window, daydreaming, saying, Les, can you do this? Can you make this happen? I used to listen to tapes day in and day out about see you at the top, my, my great friend Zig. And, and, and Dennis Waitley and different other motivational speakers and Dr. Norman Vincent Peale and Dexter saying, don't let nobody steal your dream. I used to ask myself, can I do this? And something said within me, you're the one. You're the one. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. While you're here, and before you go back home to your respective cities and communities, Write down at least five reasons on why you deserve your dream, on why you won't give up, what's going to make you unstoppable, why you must be unreasonable, because logical, practical thinking says you can't do it today. But if you want to produce unreasonable results in your life, like living your dream and taking charge of your destiny, you've got to be an unreasonable person. You've got to be an uncommon person. So write down the reasons of why you're here. My first major goal was to buy my mother a home. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. What, what will reasons do, Les? Nietzsche said, if you know the why for doing, you can endure almost anyhow. What do you mean by that? If you know why you're doing something, when the hard times come and they're going to come, when the disappointments and the rejections come and they're going to come by the truckloads, your reasons will be your rod and staff to comfort you, to pick you up. Once again, I got a saying on one of my tapes, if life knocks you down, try and land on your back. Because if you can look up, you can get up. Let your reasons get you back up. Don't stop running towards your dream. It's very important as you hold on to that dream, there are moments when you're going to doubt yourself. There are rough times that are going to come, but they have not come to stay. They have come to pass. It's very important for you to know that. Don't say I'm having a bad day. Say I'm having a character building day. It's very important for you to believe that you are the one to make this happen. I remember this high school teacher, Mr. Leroy Washington, at the end of school one June, it was just a few days before we were supposed to leave, and I just got my report card, and it indicated that I'd fail history, and I'd fail English, and I would have to go to summer school. And I was feeling within myself that I was a failure, that I, I'm slower than most people in, in getting paperwork, and, and I was feeling down on myself and, and, and very negative. And Mr. Washington was giving a speech to the graduating seniors, and I was in 11th grade. And even though I wasn't supposed to be in there, I went in there because the speech he was giving, that speech was for me. And as he talked, my heart began to beat fast. Tears begin to run by my eyes and, and I was in the back just listening to him because he said, and he was a very dramatic man, I still talk to him to this day. He said, as graduating seniors of Booker T. Washington High School, I want you to know that you're blessed and highly favored. 
and that as you go toward the future begin to know that you have greatness within you and if just one of you here begin to envision yourselves as being blessed and highly favored to reach your goals if just one of you capture the essence of what that means that you have greatness within you and a responsibility to manifest that greatness that you can make your parents proud you can make your school proud you can touch millions of people's lives and the world will never be the same again because you came this way and the students gave him a rousing standing ovation and as he left the auditorium I ran down the steps and I caught him in the parking lot I said Mr. Washington he said yes I said do you remember me sir he said no I said uh, my name is Leslie Brown my mother she works in the cafeteria here I'm one of the twins Leslie and Wesley I said Mr. Washington but you know you know I got these big dreams you know I like talking to people I love people I said I, I want to work with people and I got this dream of buying my mama a home could could I do that Mr. Washington he said it's possible Mr. Brown and as he walked away I called him again I said Mr. Washington he said what do you want now I said um I'm the one sir I said I'm the one you you remember me sir I'm this maybe Brown's boy I'm the one I'm the one